Doubtless, our stories are what drew him in. This was the first real Halloween after our town lifted the COVID restrictions, and most of us were taking advantage of it. My friends and I were probably a little too old to trick or treat, but it didn't really matter to us. We made some last minute costumes and we went out to join the kids, though I don't think any of them were fooled. We were 13, nearly ready for high school, but but they filled our pillowcases nonetheless. Rich was some kind of cowboy. Hank, a car crash victim with some red paint and a little makeup, and I threw on a long cloak from my old sister's costume trunk and some fake vampire teeth to make me look particularly ghoulish, and the three of us had hit the street. The candy was secondary anyway, and we all knew it. Halloween fell on Friday this year, you see. That meant we could go eat our candy at the fire pit once we were done. And our parents probably wouldn't expect us home till late. The fire pit was a common spot for us to go to when the weather was good. When we were lighting a fire, telling ghost stories around it. Usually roasting marshmallows or hot dogs to go along with the tales. It was something we looked forward to, and it wasn't something we got to do in a while. So with our parents' blessing, we put our pillowcases over our shoulders and stalked into the woods that surrounded the cul-de-sac where we lived. The rains had been light this year, and after collecting up some branches and getting a fire going, we set about starting our stories as the round Halloween moon hung overhead. Rich had just begun a story about a group of kids camping in the woods on Halloween, when he suddenly stopped and squinted into the trees. What? asked Hank, clearly smelling mischief as he tossed the stick of a blow pop into the fire. I could have sworn I just saw something, Rich said, like a fairy fire or something. I turned to look, thinking he was building tension for his story when... I saw it too. It was like... dancing candles. The shapes bouncing and jouncing in the dark, and the closer it came, the easier it was to recognize. It was too cohesive to be fireflies, and too consistent to be anything but what it was. The closer it came, the more I could make out the familiar shape of a jack-o'-lantern, though the realization did little to put me at ease. Unless it was being carried by a ghost, then someone had to be holding it, and the idea of some random person wandering in the woods at night was a little off-putting all on its own. The owner of the pumpkin turned out to be an old tramp who smelled as if he had bathed in cheap liquor. He came swaying out of the woods, singing a slurry song as he came. We all hunched a little, as we hoped he would pass us by. The call of the fire turned out to be a little too much for him, though, and I caught the last remains of his song as he crunched into the clearing. And Stingy Jack was turned away, for nary heaven or hell did want him. But Satan lit a friendly face, so a smile would go afore him. He sang out the last line as he came to the fire, plopping down on the log as if it had been left there for him. He was dressed in shabby cast-off clothes, the pants cuffs full of cockleburs, and the shirt covered in stains. His burnt orange hair had grown into his beard, and it was hard to see much of his face through the tangle. He sat the jack-o'-lantern in his lap, the gourd having a handle through it, strangely, and nodded at the three of us as we stared mistrustfully at him. A foreign evening to you, then I mean to startle you, I'd... I thought this fire might be unoccupied, but I see I was mistaken. You wouldn't mind sharing a tale of two with old Jackie now, would you? His accent was very thick, thicker than I'd ever heard in my whole life, and three of us just stared at each other before shrugging. They didn't seem to be any harm in the old fella, and maybe he had a tale or two to tell as well. It was kind of novel to have someone else who might tell a story, but he told him he was welcome to listen if he wanted. Rich continued his story about the three kids camping on Halloween and how the mysterious whistler who tormented them had finally driven them crazy. Rich even whistled a little in a few parts, and we were all pretty spooked by the end. I cast a glance at our stowaway, but he just sat placidly on his stump with his beetle-black eyes twinkling and the tangle of his beard and his pumpkin winking in the slight breeze. A fine story, he said looking across the fire at the rest of us. Anyone else got a good tale? Nothing I like more on Halloween than a good yarn. 
Hank tossed a Jolly Rancher into his mouth, and around the slight lisp of the dissolving candy against his cheek, he told a story about a kid who hated jack-o'-lanterns. As Hank's story went on, I found my eyes glued to the old fella as his smiling eyes took a distinctly downward cast. He clutched his pumpkin tightly as Hank talked about how the boys had smashed them, all in the service of the green man, and he didn't seem to care for that much. I suddenly wondered how long he'd been toting that pumpkin and whether it was an actual gourd or some kind of prop. His bearded face twisted when Hank mentioned the green man, and I began to wonder if it was a legend that he was aware of. Rich did a little golf clap as Hank finished, but the old vag was still clutching his pumpkin like he might try to steal it. The green man. Have you seen him around these parts? Hank laughed. Of course not, sir. It's just a story. Nobody really believes in the green man. He's a legend. When do we tell to scare each other? The old man nodded at Hank, but to me, it looked condescending. It was the same look that little kids give you when you tried to tell them there was no Santa Claus. It was a look that said, sure, that's what you say, but we know better, don't we? He loosened his grip on his gourd, turning to me as if to ask if I had a story for him, too. Um, I, I guess I do, I said. Though it's not a very scary story. Psh, Rich said. Hey, what kind of story is it? We all told spooky ones, so this one better be something awesome if it isn't scary. The old man was looking at me with interest, too, as if he knew exactly what I might tell and was excited to hear it. Um, it's an old story that my grand told me when I was little. She used to tell it to me while we were carving pumpkins, and it's supposed to be from the old times. You know, It's about a man named Stingy Jack and how he's the reason for jack o -lanterns. Rich rolled his eyes, but one look at the old fella showed me that I had his undivided attention. It's also about how he tricked the devil, not once, but twice. That had his attention, and Rich leaned back as he looked over, nodding for me to continue. The old man was nodding too, and I smiled as I started my story. Stingy Jack was supposed to be one of the most skinflint drunks in the village that he lived in. He, he never bought any new clothes, he didn't take care of his property, and he was a sot drunk every day including Sunday. He was not held in high regard by the townspeople, but a, as little they liked him, none could argue that Jack was clever. He never wanted for whiskey or money, and his deals and bets often set him against the townspeople. It was widely believed that one day he would come to a sticky end, and one day his reputation caught up with him. So you see, the devil had heard of his cleverness and how his trickery might rival even his own. So he came to earth to try and weasel the old drunk out of his soul so he could claim his cleverness for his own. Jack was sleeping beneath an old tree when the devil appeared before him. And even half asleep, he was formidable. He begged the devil to grant him one request before he took him to the underworld. And when the old imp asked what it was, he said... He wanted one last drink at the local tavern. My friends were listening, but it was more out of polite interest. The story had no monsters, murderers, or any of the usual scary story fare. They were getting a little bored with my grandma's Irish folk tales. They, however, were not the ones I had been targeting with the tale, and the old man was leaning forward on his log, and was close enough I was worried his beard might catch a light. So, one drink became two, two became too many. And soon the devil was well and truly drunk. So when Jack passed him the bill, What use do denizens of hell have for money? he asked. The barman, standing back in fear as the old demon raged, Jack, however, had an answer. May not turn yourself into a gold piece. Then we can be paying this one in full. And ye can be taking me on to the fiery underworld. So the devil did just that. He turned himself into a fat gold piece. But before the barman could scoop it up, Jack had popped it into his pocket right next to his mother's rosary. The devil writhed and begged, wanting to be free of this prison, but Jack told him that he wouldn't let him go unless he promised to spare his soul for another ten years. The devil agreed to this deal hastily, and Jack took the coin and tossed it from him as far as he could. The devil had been bested, but he didn't fret. What was ten years to him, after all? He could wait on Jack's soul a little longer. And he returned to hell to wait for the deal to be over. 
that didn't bother to look at my friends, but had eyes only for the strange old man. He was the best audience I'd ever had. Looking intently at me, his grand tail unwound like an old soft yarn. So, ten years went by, and the devil returned to, once again, collect Jack's soul. He found him sleeping beneath the same tree, having aged not a day from the last time he'd seen him. He told Jack that today he would repay his debt, but ten years had done nothing to dull Jack's cleverness. He begged the devil once again for a single boon before he took him to hell, an apple from the tastiest tree for his final meal. The Satan was hesitant, to say the least, but he could find no trap here, so he climbed the tree to get the apple. It was late season, however, and the only remaining apples were at the very top. As he climbed up the thick old branches, this gave Jack plenty of time to carve a cross at the bottom of the tree, trapping him up in the boughs. So <laughs> the devil cursed and rallied the man, begged and pleaded, and finally offered him riches beyond measure. Jack, however, only wanted one thing. I paused, letting the suspense draw out a little, though I suspected it was just for the haggard old man. He wanted to never again be bothered by the fallen angel or any of his ilk, and to never be in danger of his soul going to hell again. So the devil again rallied and threatened and begged and pleaded, but in the end, he surrendered and gave the old man what he wanted. He went back to hell, the loser, in yet again another exchange, but Jack's victory and his luck was not the last. The old man sat back a little clearly not looking forward to the rest of the story. He liked tales of cleverness all well and good, but it appeared this part might be a sore subject for him. I suspected even more now that I knew what had brought him to the fire, and it was something else that Gran had told me on the porch when I was just a tyke. He was not a young man, and when he died of natural causes not long after, there was a question of where he would go. I mean, he could not go to heaven, for he had not lived a godly life, but he couldn't go to hell because of the deal that he'd made. So Jack was forced to walk the earth. But the devil gave him something to remember him by. He gifted him a coal of hellfire and a gourd to carry it in. So stingy Jack walked the earth for all time with that gourd to light his way. And the face it carries has become the pumpkin that we all carved to ward away the devil should he come to our homes some Halloween night. There was silence after the story ended, and the wind rustled the leaves as we all sat watching the homeless man. He sat like a statue, grinning behind his beard as the pumpkin flickered ghoulishly. Were the flames a little bit too green? It might have been, but I couldn't be sure. The leaves made a skeletal sound in the wind as a knot popped in the fire. It brought us all back to our senses. Not really scary, Rich said, but it was interesting. How about you, sir? Got any stories you'd... But he stopped. As he looked dumbfounded at the place where the old man had been. The log was empty, save for a pumpkin sitting on it. I kept that pumpkin. Taking it home and keeping it well past the Halloween season... It burns in my window sill now, and the ghostly glow casts long shadows up my wall. I don't know why I told that story. It was one that I hadn't thought of in years, but it seemed fitting. Somehow, and I don't know how, I think I knew who it was that sat by the fire that night and decided to remind him that there are people who remember him. And Gran certainly did often telling the story when I was a kid. And Stingy Jack was one of her favorite stories to tell us, so we gathered around the fire for a tale. She always told us that if we should see him around our fire, that it was best to flatter creatures of the hereafter a little, so they wouldn't haunt us for long. Watching the ghostly flames dance on the wall, as I write this. I guess he was pleased.
Fall is finally here, and it's finally cooling down, which means it's time for you guys to get yourself a hot cup of tea. My wife happens to sell tea. Etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea sells different teas that are inspired by nerdy based things, as well as a bunch of new teas that are available for the Halloween season. My personal favorite, and the one that I drink whenever I'm recording, is Dark and Stormy Night. It has a little Mr. Creepypasta symbol on it, and if you ask, you can get a little Mr. Creepypasta dabbing sticker. Also, anytime that you order one of those, you actually get my autograph on a little card, so if you want that, hey, you can get that. And finally, I want to give a huge thank you to everybody who supports me on Patreon. So I want to give a very special thank you to Jordan Humble, Diana Krause, Disciple, Strategy Wolf Emoji, Sully Man, Brandon Mendoza, Brimstone Pandemonium, Kaltuna, William Wellington, Scruffy the Janitor, Brenna Crow, Lakeda Canizales, Smiley the Psychotic, Jenna, Dante Kincaid, Simba's Bloody Mojo, Mephistopheles, Curse Pox Primark, M, Jesus Corneo, Yargul, Verbal Horror, Amber Clark, Jay Kearns, Mike, Himbo Jerry, Crusader Chocobo, Gordon Dallas, Estebean, Seclude, Salty Surprise, Red Shadow Cat, Turtle Man, Cryolinian, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Dirt Diver 030, Voice of Sand, Psychomel, Melted Lake, Tali Sue, William King, Sashi Sazaku, Croconut 509, Stricken, Freddy Krueger, Hades Nephew, Acid System, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, and Corey Kenshin. I really appreciate your support, and I cannot thank you enough. I wish you all the best. Sweet dreams.